Hello and welcome to our chapter on functions. Functions, of course, are an important part of any programming language. Uh, there are store and reuse pattern. In this lecture, of course, audio, video, and slides are copyright, Creative Commons, attribution. So why functions? Well, first off, we've got to teach you how to use the functions because a lot of the work you do in any programming language is calling the right function at the right time. Uh, things like uppercasing or searching for a string in another string or something like that. And then over time, we start to, our code gets more and more complex and we uh, write our own functions to reduce the complexity of our code. So a lot of times in a beginning programming class, uh, teachers are like cr function crazy because they're trying to teach you about how to segment your thinking. And I'm not particularly function crazy. I, I figure that by the time you need a function, um, or I'll be giving you code that has functions before you'll be writing your own. And about the time your code gets like big enough for a function, um, it'll be okay for you and you'll be natural and you'll just do it and that'll be the answer to that. So the, the idea is you get tired after a while of repeating yourself and so you take this little code and you parameterize it so you can use it over and over by changing a few little things. So, And uh, you start building libraries and then document those libraries and pretty soon you know, your code is really quite nice and every little bit of functionality has its place kind of on the shelf in the right spot. So we have a lot of built-in functions and the strings are a common set of this kind of stuff that, that we work with. Um, and so the PHP has a lot of these functions. Um, you have to look them up. I mean, I, I, I never memorize these um, and I program in PHP all the time. I can't remember the parameter order or anything like that. Um, I think it's probably just because there are way too many of them. And so here's a good example of, um, there we go. Here's a good example of, you know, this the string reverse function, the repeat function says, I'm going to repeat this twice. Hip, hip. Now notice I put the space there, which means there's actually a space right there too. Uh, uppercase. And there's a whole, whole series of these things. Um, And so for me, when I'm doing documentation, I, I can't remember them. And so I just say, I find it difficult to write PHP on airplanes because I am so addicted to using Google to say PHP string replace function. And it always comes up the first link. And sometimes I can figure it out from Google without actually clicking on the page. But uh, it's more common that I'm like, oh, what are the parameters? And, and the part that I just cannot remember for the life of me is this part right here. You know, what's the first parameter? What's the second parameter? You know, this is the thing that you're going to change. This is the old string, the new string, and the return value is the modified string with all the stuff replaced. And so I just do this over and over again. I should probably come up with a way to have the PHP documentation always on my laptop so that, well, if I used an integrated development environment, it solved that problem too. <laughs> but I don't do that because I'm so old school. So one of the functions that uh, you, you, it, it's not really a, a function that you use except when you're debugging your PHP installation. Um, chances are good that you've got some kind of a pre-configured PHP environment that a system administrator set up. Perhaps if you have your own Linux box um, and you're using commands like apt-get or whatever setting it up, you are choosing what components to install in your PHP. But PHP has been around a long time, new features get added, they get added in a certain version, and there are ways to kind of sneak those features into old versions. So when it's all said and done, the particular PHP that you're using, and it could be different on your laptop and a server, and all those could be quite different PHPs. So they got this great function called PHP info. It's, it doesn't take any parameters, and it generates a whole lot of HTML. A lot of very, very pretty HTML. And so it spits out pages like this. I mean, I, you just you just put it in a script. So this I often call it inf.php. And then I hit that script. I hit that script and I get something like this. I called it info.php in this particular situation. Let me change my color to yellow. So I hit info.php and then it starts giving you all kinds of information 
like when that was built, what system is it running on, all kinds of stuff. And then there's all these parameters and, and default settings. And if you remember, and this is a good time to remind you, remember about the PHP error settings so that you actually see errors when things are happening? That we looked at this data to check to see what our error setting was. Then we ended a file, restarted our servers, and verified that the error setting was right. So you can scroll through and see, you know, what version of JSON are you running in this thing? So if all of a sudden the JSON libraries or the XML libraries start not working, you kind of have to look down and see what's going on. Now things like JSON and XML are very common in most of the PHPs. It's rare. But then there are other things that you might run across like zip, zip support, the ability to open uh, zip files and read the contents of zip files. Um, that you might have to, you know, you have to read through and you'll talk to your admin and say, oh, the version of the version of this thing is wrong or I'm missing this whole thing or you'll check on your laptop and you'll see that one of these things is there and then you check on the server and you see it's not there and then you either got to if you own the server your super user on the server then you can install it and add it to your PHP usually with a couple of simple commands um, but if it's on your laptop then you can run it but usually if you're using like MAMP or XAMP or one of the things that we suggest you download it has a ton of stuff and so you're pretty well off at that point. So that's kind of reading the PHP configuration. Um, the function keyword is the, the PHP keyword for starting a function. Uh, then you have the name and then there is a parentheses with optional arguments. And then you have a block of code which is the starting and ending of a, of a uh, curly brace set pair of curly braces and then you've got sort of the body of the function and again white space doesn't matter but um, we do this the function call you just now have effectively extended the language you, you take the function name that you defined and then optionally put any parameters in and away you go so we say greet 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 I mean this is all one big PHP thing it defines the function here and then runs the function four times and you can kind of think of this as if you run through the code it doesn't do anything now except remember the function and then it goes hits greet then it goes up and runs this code and comes back and then goes up and runs the code again then comes back and then goes up here and runs the code again and then come back and continue and so that's how functions functions work you can also send return values back and that return value is basically the residual value of a call so in the other ones we in the previous one we just had the function call by itself on a line we didn't do anything with the residual value but this now is an expression so greeting is going to call the function greeting parentheses is going to call function and then a residual value and so you know it comes in defines this function the returns keyword is what decides what that residual residual value is this is of course an extremely trivial function and it always returns the string hello so it comes in it, it's it's looking at this expression it's really actually this whole thing, if you think about it, is an expression. You want to concatenate whatever the results of the call to the function greeting are with the string space glen in a new line. So it goes up and runs it, and then the return value, this return value, becomes the residual uh, when that comes back from the function. And then hello and glen are concatenated together. Hello and glen are concatenated together to produce that particular line of output. And then it does it again, and then you see hello Sally you can also pass arguments into the function and so in the function definition you create basically a variable um, this 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 dollar lang is kind of different than other variables it really is sort of an alias to whatever you pass in right so the real data is the thing you pass in when you make the function call um, and so dollar $lang in the first function call will be the string ES. And so you use it inside the function. It's a relative value inside the function that is whatever my first parameter was. That's kind of, so dollar $lang is like the first parameter. And, um, and so it's, it's, it, it doesn't really exist before or after the function. It sort of is sort of dynamically materializes as the function starts, but it's really just an alias to whatever that first parameter is, whether it's a constant or another variable. So if we look at this and the code runs, you know, we define the function, 
It's got a return statement. So then it, it goes in and it's going to evaluate this expression. It's concatenating two things. Oh, but that the expression is itself an expression. It's a function. So call howdy and pass, EN as, uh, pass ES. So this runs and says return Ola. And so that concatenates Ola with Glenn. And out she comes. And a similar, it says bonjour for Sally after it runs the function again. And so arguments allow us to write generally reusable code, but with little bits that change as we put different data in on the parameters. Let's come down. You can also make arguments optional. The syntax for this, I think, is really very, very elegant. And, um, and so basically, you've got the function and then the function name, and then the variable that is your first parameter, and then the default value is like an assignment statement. And the way I read this is, lang is whatever the first parameter was, unless the first parameter was omitted, and then it, it is the string, quote, es, quote. And the rest of the function sort of functions the same. You see that we can uh, print howdy and with no parameter, and that means that $lang will be es in this first execution, and then $lang will be fr in the second execution. So again, I, I think this is actually a really as simple and straightforward and elegant a way to communicate this notion of a default value if a parameter is omitted. You tend to like to, if you're going to have multiple parameters, you want to put, you know, the first ones here and then the, the optional ones at the end. Okay, and so um, you tend to want to put the required parameters at the beginning and the optional ones at the end. You can name function names very much like variables, but they don't start with dollar sign. That's one of the nice things in code. Both the built-in functions and the uh, functions that you define don't have very uh, don't have dollar signs, and so it's a, a way to automatically know whether it's a variable or a function. So that even though I don't like the dollar sign, that's a good uh, side effect of the dollar sign. So other than that, it starts with a letter or uh, an underscore, and then has the numbers and underscores and letters after that. And of course, you do not want to write a function that overwrites the built-in function names because then your code and everyone else's code is going to get sort of funky. There is this notion of calling by reference and calling by value. Uh, most function calls uh, call generally by value, which means that, um, that not only is the parameter an alias, it's, a param it's an alias to a copy of the value. So if we think of val as a variable here, you know, to find the function, and val is 10. So, you know, here we have val over here, and there's a 10 in val, dollar val. Okay, so we got a 10 in val. And then we run into this code, and we are passing val in. Now, the question is, is alias exactly the same, everything we do to alias, including changing it here, because we're changing it in this statement right here, including changing it, does that actually change the original val? And so what happens really in this case, in a call by value situation, is dollar alias exists, and then the 10 is copied into it, okay? So, so then this code runs, and when we multiply it by two and it becomes 20, this copy is changed, and it returns 20, because alias is this sort of local copy running inside the function, and then so dval ends up being 20, but val remains 10 after the code comes back. So, so, so you can actually use your parameters and change them uh, without hurting the originals. Okay, so that's the key. That's call by value. Call by reference is when you want to indicate that you're about to change it. And so the way this works is you simply add the ampersand to the function header where you want to take that variable and make it a call by reference. By reference means it's only one thing and everything you do to it, whether it's reading or writing, is really messing with the original value. And so $val in this case is 10, right? So the code runs here, val is 10. Then we call triple and real thing really and truly just points to val, meaning real thing is not a copy of it the way it was in the previous slide. And so if we multiply that by 3 it then and then assign it, so this becomes 30, then we assign it back into real thing, it really assigns it into val. And so when we come back, val is 30. Okay, so val is 30 when it comes back. That's call by reference, meaning not call by a copy. 
And I think it's a pretty elegant syntax. Um, other languages have different ways of doing this. We simply have this little ampersand in the function call that says, hey, that first parameter you're going to give me, I may choose to change it. And if I do, I'll change your copy. So variable scope. Um, even though the code that I've been showing you is kind of relatively small, it is not difficult for a variable inside of a function potentially to have the same name as a variable in the code outside the function. Especially if you're talking about a variable like dollar $count, right? We might use count in a loop or, um, you know, a variable like dollar $done. We might use it inside of a function and outside of the function. We want, we do not want modifications to those outside variables to happen inside the function, right? And so it means that you've called this function that you think is going to, you know, give you hello in different languages, and all of a sudden this variable count is different when you came back, and it's like, ah, I don't want that to happen. And so these things are scoped or namespaced, and that is the function variables, the variables inside that function are namespace. It's almost like this long prefix that is unique to that function. They're like little padded cells of uh, groups of names. And so if this case we're going to have a val outside in this function, so the you know dollar $val outside has a 10 in it. And then when we run this code, there is inside this little world another val that has a 100 in it. Now these aren't the same thing because this lives in its own little environment, a namespace or a padded cell or a silo or, or whatever. And so the variable names don't bleed between inside the function and outside the function. And so this function doesn't do much, but it runs, changes this value to 100, then the function finishes and actually this data actually then goes away when the function finishes and it comes back and zap this val is still 10, right? It's, it was 10. Even though the name of this thing was val, it's like thinking of this thing as like, you know, um, this one's dollar val 10. I don't get, and this one would be called like dollar try zap underscore val, which is 100. And, and it's not exactly like this, but this notion that these aren't the same things. These functions here are given their own space. And a prefix is kind of like what it looks like, even though that's this is not what's going on, but it's kind of like that. Kind of like that. Kind of like it. I hope I didn't I hope I didn't confuse you more by that example. If that example, you will disregard that example if it confused you more. And go back, scroll back, and then ignore the part where I put that prefix on. But it's kind of what's happening. Now Sometimes you want to share between the inner scope and the outer scope. And so if you think of uh, this is kind of like an isolation unit that says variable names inside here uh, don't leak out. If you want to break a little hole, if you want to break a little hole through this thing and get yourself out, well, you say, I'm going to say global, and that is a PHP thing. That's a PHP keyword. And you basically say, look, this dollar val, I want it to be escaping. I want it to be the same val as any val that might be outside of me. So now dollar val has one, and it's got a 10 in it. But then this dollar val, this assignment statement, changes that to 100. Okay? So it changes it to 100. So that just means that for all the variables that you say dollar global to, it they are no longer in the little padded cell. All the other variables that use in the function stay in the padded cell, but the variables that get out of the function sort of talk to the global scope. But be careful. This can be dangerous. Um, I tend to uh, would never do this code. I would never name it val. I would name this code something like dollar you know, mega, all uppercase, value <laughs> equals. So I tend to make all of my global variables be all uppercase to kind of like shout, to say, yo, this is a really important thing and be careful. So I don't tend to use lowercase and I don't tend to use short names. I tend to use longer variables for global. 
and the fact that you're not supposed to do it very often means that you should sort of be punished by having to type really long variable names, if that makes any sense. So, there are reasons to use global variables. You'd always prefer to pass a variable in as a parameter or pass the value back as return value or even pass something more complex in by reference and then modifying it inside of the function. And if you absolutely must use global variables, maybe things are passing between some kind of a library, use really long names with really good long prefixes, something like that, or all uppercase. So this is sort of about, this whole chapter is about not repeating yourself and coding something and then reusing it. So I want to talk a little bit about multiple files, how you program in multiple files. It's not exactly functions, but it's functionality that's coming from another file. And if your programs, your web applications get large enough, you might want to break them into multiple files so you can do some reuse and not repeat yourself. This is all about DRY, don't repeat yourself. So if you go look at the PHP intro site, you will look, you know, there's got a couple of pages here, you know, this page and this page. But if you look, other than a few tiny little changes, this navigation part looks exactly the same between pages. So I've got to have two pages. Um, I should clear it. This one is named, oh, this is the index page, and this is the install.php page. You probably can't even read that. But they're two different pages. And so, but I have this navigation that I want to be the same on each one. So I can either put the navigation in, in the two files, and then if I change it in this page, I gotta change it in this page, right? Or I can put the navigation all in one place. And so PHP has a mechanism to allow that, and that is the include statement. And so um, <clears throat> I have a set of files that are being included I have an include file for the header stuff, which is the non-visible stuff to set up JavaScript and CSS for all my pages so that they're consistent. That has all like the color, the light blue color and all that stuff. I have this, then I have, so I have my HTML, my head, and then I include all my CSS and JavaScript in header.php. And then I have my body start, and then I include the navigation bit right here. So there's a navigation bit that I include and that's in nav.php. And then I have a div, and that div is all of this stuff, right? Blah, 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 that's all this stuff. And then you can't see the footer here, but I also have a common footer that I put on every page before I close the body. And so three, three, this, is, this file is index.php, and it includes from header, nav, and footer. Now, you might think, oh, this is slow or performs badly. But PHP is like so cleverly awesome that this has no negative performance impact whatsoever. And it, it greatly improves our, uh, the code and how much we like our code. And so this is, a, this is a great path and a great pattern. Now, if we look at the other page, the install.php page, we see I can then include the header and the nav. And then the only real thing is different is this middle bit, which is an iframe to make this part different, but the header and nav are there once, and the footer, which is kind of down here, and in this case it's kind of silent, but it's basically a way to reuse the files. And I would put in the same folder on my server the index.php, header.php, nav.php, footer.php, and install.php. Put them all in the same folder, and now I can kind of construct them, and it's really nice to have this reuse of the header, the nav, and the footer across many things, and I just gave you two examples, but there could literally be, you know, hundreds of files that want to reuse uh, header and navigation material uh, on your ultimate website. So there's a couple of different forms of this. You can call them either as sort of language elements where you say include space and then header, or you can put a parenthesis here if you want, and then a semicolon. Um, and then there is um, include, which pulls a file in and you can do it more than one time. Include once means it pulls the file in but checks to see if you've already pulled it in before. Um, these are non-fatal if the file doesn't exist, although they do give you nasty messages. Uh, these are fatal. The require and require and require once are like uh, exactly the same as include and include. It's just that they fail when uh, the file's not there. 
And uh, like I said, you can use either the sort of language element syntax or the function style syntax where you pass the name of the file. The nice thing about this is you can use a variable if you're deciding to you know, include a file that's itself uh, uh, something you've concatenated in a string. Although that's not common. Well, it's, it's common to concatenate strings to make things, but... So, one of the things that I started this was I talked about the info, and the info tells you what is and is not installed in your PHP environment. And you will say, oh, crud, this is missing blank. I, I'm having trouble with uh, lots of different environments don't have the functions that support internationalization, and that's simultaneously supporting more than one language. And so I wrote this code, and it calls these functions to set the text domain and various other things. But then I find that like two-thirds of the PHP environments I try don't have these functions and my code starts blowing up. It works in one on my desktop because it has the functions. But some server I put it up doesn't have the functions. So what do I do? Well, it turns out that because this PHP is such a moving target and different PHP environments um, are so different and because you want to write code that works in all these environments at least falls falls safely. It kind of safely, you know, backs off to something. Uh, sometimes actually it does a, it detects that a function's not there and then it adds it, your own copy of it. But you don't want to add your own copy of the function if it's already there in PHP. And so, blah, 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 all that comes down to the fact that there is a special function in PHP called function underscore exists. And it really at, takes a string as a parameter and it says, is that function present in my particular PHP? Now, you're running the same code in many potential environments. So this might be true in, in, in your desktop, and it might be false on your server. So um, in this case, I'm just doing an echo, but usually you'll do something different. You will either it, use it if it exists, or maybe sometimes you define the function. You define the function right in there. So it's conditionally creating a new function, but it only creates the new function if the function doesn't already exist. And this is just something uh, later in the course when we look at some of the code that I've written, you'll see me doing this. And I'm like, I tried to run it there and like it doesn't work on Windows. Like, oh, it's missing that. So then I have to like put some if code in there. It seems like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. Why are they doing that? And that's because PHP is still evolving. It's a it's a rich and dynamic and, and it needs to adapt to the future but then not everybody upgrades at the same time. I mean, there's just literally millions and millions of PHP instances. Some are previous versions, some are way previous versions. So, so you have to cope with missing bits once in a while. Eh, it's not so bad. So in this lecture, we talked about built-in functions and, and how we call them. We talked about the PHP info function, which is kind of like your configuration dumper. Uh, arguments, the pass by value and pass by reference, uh, default values, uh, including and requiring files, and then checking to see if functions are present. So, so there you go. See you in the next lecture.